to do anything crazy, just stand up. I'm just gonna shake the room out a little bit before we get into the afternoon session. Okay, it's very, very simple this. I want you to take one step to this, to your left, my right. Okay. Back to the middle. One step the other way. <laughs> Back to the middle. It's brilliant having control of the audience. Okay, sit down folks. <laughs> really simple. Uh, before I do my presentation, I had a chat with my, a kind of like, um, my, my coach, my mentor, and he said, as soon as you're able to move the audience, you've made it as a speaker. So, I've just moved the audience. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we've got a great afternoon plan, folks. As you can see, we've got some more master classes coming your way. A little afternoon break just to refresh the, and energize, and then back into the afternoon session before we finish today for drinks. And we're all hanging out for those. So the next session is with me, and we're going to do a little bit of a kind of a conversational marketing kind of master class. I'm just going to start this so I can keep an eye. Because when you're MC and you're actually presenting at the same time, you have to also time yourself. So you have to do two things together. So the Conversational Marketing Masterclass is all about a lot of the stuff that we, we covered at the very beginning in the opening of this, but also some of the masterclasses you've had already in this morning's session, is really about how do we create this contact, this conversation, this kind of relationship with our customers, you know, more so. Um, so I'm going to cover a whole bunch of stuff today. Some of it you may have heard before, it may be a, ref a refresher for you to kind of think about, okay, yeah, we kind of forgot about that. Um, and other stuff might be new. Um, and I'll also give you some, what I call the art and science of marketing, which I think is really where we're all about today. We've got to have the art, which is the creative. If we don't have the creative, then we've got all this, this kind of average sameness, kind of boring marketing that everyone's just going to not, you know, thumb pass, they're not going to click on. Um, and then if we don't have the science, we're not understanding what our consumers, our buyers, our customers, our prospects want. So it's this balance, this nice balance between the art and the science of marketing. So how far we've come in terms of conversational marketing. Here's just a, a kind of a quick snapshot. I did at the beginning kind of showed you a bit about Netflix and how we'd come from kind of the, those movie stores. But you know, all this conversation kind of stuff, if we think back to the 1980s, you know, it all started when we started building new com communication technologies from telegraphs and then the computer came in, you know, the old ping pong and stuff, or pong as it was called then. Then of course we had the internet sort of coming into the, into the 90s and Google started uh, giving us a lot more of that interaction. And then the old SMS smartphones came in and we started talking to each other through SMS, very much a two-way conversation. But then we started to engage a little bit more with our phones and this is where the apps sort of came in around 2010s and then onwards. And then finally we kind of moved on to these messenger apps and the messenger apps allowed us now to have more of two-way conversations and um, we did it kind of personally. We started sending us pictures of things, certainly a load of cats. I think when we very first started, I used to hit, hit heaps of those cat videos. Um, but then we started to think about how we use this for our businesses and this is what we're going to talk about today is how can we start to you know, really get involved in this growing um, kind of uh, platform of, of two-way conversations. Rather than it being a one-way message, which marketing and advertising has always been about, how do we create this, this two-way conversation with our customers and our prospects? So one of the things I wanted to start off with is just to really start thinking about what I mentioned at the very beginning of here, is how our businesses need to change, how we need to change the way we do business today. If you're in a business right now, if you're a marketer for a business or you're working with clients who have a business that's slow, bumpy and expensive, and if I kind of put that another way, it's kind of like more full service, open nine till five, close for lunch on Saturdays, and then kind of buy first from us, the actual future doesn't look very good for you guys. Like it's, it's actually going to be very, very limited because there's a whole bunch of stuff, including friction, that's kind of contained in businesses like that. The new model, the new model is fast, flat and free. And this is where we need to start thinking about how do we transform our business services to becoming more of a fast, flat and free model. And basically in a nutshell that's self-service. So people actually serving themselves when they want to. It's about being open 24-7. So we're, not, we're allowing the customers, the consumers, the prospects to engage with us when they want to, 24 hours, 7 days a week. And it's about this try first mentality where we're kind of giving them, here's the product, here's our service, have a try of it, have a play with it, enjoy it, learn to um, live with it, understand it, and then pay for it later, rather than buying it first, and then obviously then people realizing that maybe it's not a great fit for them. Simon Sinek, who's heard of Simon Sinek, yeah? We'll follow the great Simon Sinek. With Simon Sinek, 
says, as you can see the statement here, if you sell what you do, you're a vendor. If you sell why you do it, you're a brand. For those that haven't you know, caught up recently, check out the TEDx video, Starts With Why, from Simon Sinek. Because it kind of fits with, with what we were talking about earlier on today, about building tribes. Like if you're not you know, actually um, focused on what your why message is, why it is that you are standing for what you're, you're doing and what you stand for in the marketplace, then people aren't really going to get behind you. There's not going to be this kind of tribal connection with what you do. You know, and today more than ever, a brand, this is the best statement I've fed for a brand, a brand is what people say about you when you're not around. So all of us, it doesn't matter whether we're big business, small business, a startup business, or a mature business, we're all a brand. And the brand is the thing that people are talking about right now. Well, you're here at this conference. What are people saying about your brand or your client's brands when you're not sitting in this room right now? And they're the things we need to, we need to manage, we need to understand, because if our message isn't clear enough to the market about what our brand stands for, why can we expect people to kind of follow us and be part of our tribe? So again, my consumer slide or my millennial slide or whatever you want to do, I think we talked about before about how the audience is changing about how we've got this multiple cross-section from the millennials and the Zs to the baby boomers and the Y gen. It's kind of like, you know, or the X gen. It's, it's kind of like thinking, how do we make our message? If we're not very specific about a buyer persona and we're kind of looking at a range of people, how do we change that message? Because it does matter which of those audience segments you go after. So we always look at it in the sense of if you, if you look back at you know, for example, the baby boomers, right? The baby boomers, when they first came in, they were very much about, and still are today, you matter, right? So when you're working with or marketing to a baby boomer, they understand you guys are the specialist. So you matter. You then move on to the Gen Xs, and it's the we matter. The fact that, yeah, we understand you're the specialist, but we want to kind of work with you. So you've got to think about, okay, how do we communicate in a we kind of environment? The Gen Ys came in and then it became I matter. So then we wanted this personalization as, as uh, millennials. You know, they wanted and they want people to understand where they sit in the buyer journey, who they are, personalize that experience. But then the interesting one is the Gen Zs I mentioned at the beginning of the conference. And the Gen Zs are growing like 24% next year of our kind of population. I mean, they're, not, they're still not quite there yet in terms of entering the workforce, but eventually they will be. They might not be on your target market right now, but as you start talking to and communicating with, I think they're more about they matter, being the community. They're the ones more likely to jump on TripAdvisor and rate you. They're the ones that want to give you feedback instantly. So you've got to start thinking then about, okay, how are we going to transform our business in the next few years when the Gen, Gen Z su suddenly become part of our kind of audience scope? The big thing to remember, and I think we all know this, is today's buyer knows what they want, when they want it, more than they ever have before. The guys, all of us are the same. We're all, we're all consumers, we're all buyers, we're all people. And I mean, we know what we want. We don't have time to waste on, on kind of like people trying to find out what we want. So we need to understand that the buying journey has kind of changed. So one of the things I want to cover today, I want to kind of simplify the relationship that we can have with our prospects in terms of marketing and even down to our customers because I think sometimes we're, we're always in the, in, the, in the ability to grow our businesses with new people all the time without thinking of the golden egg, which is the customers we already have. So how do we build stronger relationships with the customers we have and start forging relationships with the prospects of tomorrow? So I've kind of done it in the love story. Um, you'll see this URL, I'll share it again at the end. We actually built a whole new exper brand experience for you guys to check out. So make sure you check it out, sortofstone.com forward slash conversations. You'll see a whole new experience. It's a new thing we've been, we've been working with, um, with our American side of the business and certainly in APAC. Um, and it's basically a platform called Seros, which is very interactive. It, it puts it in the hands of the design team of an agency rather than waiting on the design to design it, the developers to develop it, QA it, and then put it out. So it becomes far more engaging, far more interactive, a fantastic piece of kind of top of the funnel um, engagement. But check it out and see what you think. But I'm going to cover a little bit of that today because we're going to go through our conversational growth strategy as a love story. Um, which we can all probably relate to. Okay, so the first part, there's just four parts to this. The very first part of our love story is to make an impression because, you know, we need to, we need to make that first impression. If people don't understand us or see us or care about us, we're not even going to get to second base. So how do we get the first base? By making the first right impression. 
So it all starts off, and again, as I said, you may have done this before, hands up who if, re if you could really say right here, right now, hand on heart, that you have a detailed buyer persona. So three, four people. Okay, so thanks very much. So number one is, this is the detail you need to go. How, how can you possibly connect with your audience if you only know them as a demographic? Oh yeah, my demographics, 25, 35, uh, AB social, you know, they're not real people. You know, back to an early point this morning on the masterclass, like it's kind of like, you know, we need to know these people as real people. So this is what we call a buyer persona. And as you can see here, one of our buyer personas is Marketing Mary. So we've detailed, we've researched, we've interviewed Marketing Marys to find out why she loves our business. And we've itemized it down into three simple things. So every time we're writing any content, or we're creating an offer, or we're trying to engage with Marketing Mary, we know that she loves us because she can learn about inbound marketing, which is a, the essence of what we're talking about today, instead of outbound marketing, which is push advertising. Uh, we provide easy to use tools that makes her life easier as a marketer. So that's why we were constantly giving her new tools, new technologies to help her life easier. And then just as importantly, number three is, I mean, her job is reporting back to her key stakeholders about the performance of her marketing. So we also make it easier for her to create fantastic reports for her sales and her SEO, CEO team. So we understand that because we've gone through this whole process of this persona um, background here, not just demographics, but also what are the challenges that keep her awake at night? What are the pain points that Mary kind of like, she's a real person, right? So she's not just a business prospect, she's a real person. Um, so how is it? Helena was talking about, you know, babies in Singapore earlier on before the break. Like, that's important to her. She's not just someone that works at Outbrain. So it's kind of like, how, how much do we know about our people? What are their common objections? This is an important one. It's like, if you can understand that, when a, when a customer or prospect comes to you and there's certain objections that stop them going ahead, you know, it could be price, could be a whole bunch of things. If you can get them out earlier on in the journey, like help them self-solve those problems before they get to you, you're going to make it a lot easier when you actually come to doing a, a, a deal or, or selling them something at the end. So these are some things you need to do. So a buyer persona is very, very important. The next thing is a brand voice. Like lots and lots of businesses now, more than ever before, outsource parts of what they do. Or they have multiple agencies doing stuff. So some over here might be doing a bit of social for them. Somebody over here might be a content writer that's writing blog posts. And then you've got someone completely different that's looking after the website. Now, if the brand voice isn't consistent, how are we, put, how are we actually going to connect? Like it's like having three or four voices all talking to us and making it all fragmented. So this little exercise, see if you want to take, obviously we share these slides later, but if you take a shot of this, this is a really interesting thing to do in your businesses or for your clients. And you go through and it's just basically an idea of what's our volume? Like how are we speaking? What's our volume that we want to take to market? Are we going to be more whispered or are we going to be in your face loud? What is it, how do we want to come across? as the voice of our brand. Our energy, is it more chilled, relaxed, laid back, or are we more the other way, manic and effervescent? You know, again, you can be anywhere on that scale. One to one for sociability or right through to universal. An attitude, is it safe and conventional or are we unconventional and polarizing? And once you kind of set this, this becomes almost like the blueprint for anybody doing content or putting advertising or marketing or whatever it out, out there for you. So you can really start to feel the essence of the power of what a brand voice can do for your business. And the reason that's important is because, you know, our buyer journey has changed. Our buyer journey has got people moving all over the place. We come, we go, we, we touch a brand on social, we might hear something from someone else in a word of mouth, we might go onto the website, off the website. Um, and if that brand voice isn't congruent across all those different channels, our experience is going to be fragmented. We're going to get a different experience here to here, and then we're going to make up our own mind up about whether that experience actually resonates with us or not. Here's an example of a car buying lady by the name of Stacy, just to show you and to demonstrate how many touch points that this particular lady had, right? And you can see here, over a period of three months, she had 139 Google searches for the car she was looking for, 14 YouTube videos she watched, 89 images she looked at 69 dealer interactions that she had, whether it's phone, the website, whatever it might be, and then 186 manufacturer interactions, because it's not just the dealer which is going to buy the car, it's the manufacturer of the car that she wants. 
So you can see on the right hand side there is kind of like how it all came down. So from exploring 14 brands in a funnel kind of format, she got it down within three months to six brands, decided on two brands and then finally bought from one. So you can see how this is just one particular example of how our prospects are out there now and that we think we can just run an ad on Google or we can you know, do some kind of marketing um, within a week and expect instant results. Like if you're not tracking the buyer journey over a longer term period and making sure you understand where people sit in that buyer journey, then you're really only getting a small portion or the tip of the iceberg. The big bulk of the iceberg is all the stuff that's happening under the ocean, all the stuff that's happening that they're not ready to buy yet, but we need, we need to be nurturing them down the buyer journey so they come closer to us when they're ready to buy. In a simplified format, it kind of looks like this. Generally people, even, even though everything that you're going to hear is over the last two days is changing, you know, AI, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening, the buyer journey is still this simple. People go through three stages. They go through an awareness stage, an awareness stage that there's something that they're missing, the car's not performing as well, I've had that car for a while, if it's a car, and I think I might be interested in another car, I'm very much a long way down the track from being able to buy a car. So if you start trying to sell to me when I'm at the awareness stage, it's not going to work because I'm not ready. But I am ready for some information. I am ready to start learning and engaging and understanding the market that I might be interested in. Consideration stage is the middle of the funnel. This is the part where I'm starting to weigh up my options. I'm starting to look at brand versus brand, you know, experience, product, service versus service. Um, it could also be about you know, different types of solutions versus different types of solutions. And then finally, the decision stage, which is really where the sales team get involved, not anything before that. It's really marketing's role to bring them down to consideration. Maybe involve sales a little bit, but not so much to sell, but to help and advise. And then decision is really where I'm still not ready to buy. I'm still one step away, but now I'm ready to engage. Now I'm ready to have a conversation about what your solution might do for me. And if we plan it all out, it means our content has to follow that process, right? We, we can't be putting out, call us now, act now, advertising, push content at the left-hand side when I'm not ready to buy. Yes, it kind of works down here, but I have to be nurtured down there. So the very start, the awareness is putting out our blog posts, our social media. What's becoming more and more apparent is this thing called brand affinity marketing. I don't know if you've heard of that, but again, two weeks ago I was in Boston at Inbound, and that was the big thing. It's almost like thinking of our brands as a Netflix, putting out content that people will engage with at the top end. The long form content that Helena was talking about, which is starting to engage people more now. More relevant, entertaining. Um, comedy is a big thing. If you can make it more relaxed, less less um, educational, it's still informative, but it's more engaging and fun, um, you're going to have more success. So those podcasts are becoming more and more popular, vidcasts and episodic kind of video series. Um, anybody seen Brandwagon by Wistia? Okay, so look that one up if you can. They're only into like maybe the third episode, but I met with the guys when I was in Boston. So Wistia, you would have heard of Wistia, is a, is a video platform. Um, they've actually been researching how video can work and came up with this idea of an episodic video series called Brandwagon and it's done like a late night TV show and it's, it's producing fantastic results and they're measuring a whole bunch of things which I'll, I'll cover off actually tomorrow afternoon uh, when we finish the conference. Um, so there we go, Lizard, then we, we're attracting people who are now visitors, they're not strangers anymore. So they're coming in and then we're giving them landing pages and content offers. We're doing this thing called lead scoring. Anyone heard of lead scoring? Yep. So lead scoring is just a way of, of us scoring people by their intent. How many times they look at a page, how many blog posts they read. You know, certain pages have certain um, scores. So we use lead scoring to kind of get a score behind the scenes. The customer prospect doesn't know this, but then it gives us the idea that these people are more engaged and more, more possible to move down the funnel than ones that are less engaged. Then from a lead we move to a customer and that's through our offers and then constantly connecting with them, constantly bringing them together, giving them more content of what they want, no, not advertising to them, just understanding they're interested in this, so I'll give them more of this. They're not interested in that, so I'll give them less of that. And our conversation gets more deeper as we go down. And then finally, you know, we keep them as a customer, we entertain them, and this is the big bit that's normally missing. We call this the delight stage where we're doing emails and content offers and social media and really enhancing the relationship now they're a customer so they become a brand ambassador and then they go all the way around again and start influencing the market to bring people back in again. 
So what we're really seeing here is that we're removing the friction. We're, we're trying to you know, stop this friction between each stage of the buyer journey. Instead of making it so that it's a step by step or it's a handover from marketing to sales and there's this friction, if we remove the friction in our buyer journey, it's gonna flow a lot easier. So if we remove the friction, one thing we probably have to do is remove the funnel. Okay, so you know, today I'm gonna challenge you to think about moving away from the funnel, burying the funnel. Okay, the whole idea of the funnel when you think about it is it's quite friction driven. Marketing bolted on to sales, bolted on to service or customers at the end. And finishing with customers when we know that relationship has only just begun. Um, and it also shows that the fact that you're going to get more people at the top and generally you're going to lose them. So the idea is now we're getting rid of the funnel, we're bringing this thing in called the flywheel. So the whole idea of the flywheel is that it is a frictionless experience. It doesn't matter where people enter. They can come in from sales because that's what they want to talk to you first. From sales they can move into service or back into marketing. However they do it, they're, they're feeling that they're dealing with the brand. And the more that they're dealing with the brand, and the more that they're feeling that there's less friction, the more that the flywheel spins. And as we all know, with a flywheel, the faster it spins, the more energy it creates, and therefore your business grows. So let's try and think about how we move away from the funnel and move more into the flywheel and have a more customer-centric approach, right? Uh, having the customers at the center. So if we take the traditional kind of funnel and we wrap it around the flywheel, it kind of looks like this. So now we have marketing, sales and service that we've had before, but now we've got the attract stage, the convert stage, the close stage and the delight stage all wrapping around that. And then in the very outer circle, we've got our strangers coming into visitors, turning into leads, leads kind of nurturing into customers and then customers being nurtured into promoters. And this is the kind of new concept that we need to start thinking about, is how do we create this frictionless buyer journey in a flywheel environment rather than the traditional funnel. So that's number one. Next, we need to move on to this marketing qualified lead. So we've already made our first impression. We've understood kind of that the customer can come into this kind of environment or ecosystem that we've created. We now need to think about how do we have our first conversation? And where is that first conversation going to happen? Because everybody nowadays is having conversations on multiple different platforms. Messaging has become the biggest thing. We all know this, and we've probably seen this before, but you know, the four biggest messaging apps have now surpassed the amount of users on the four biggest social networking apps. So what does that mean? There's more people using Messenger and connecting and using the Messenger apps like WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger than they are actually on the social media platforms that we all think we need to be communicating with. So we need to start shifting the way we communicate to thinking how can we involve our brand across these messaging apps that everybody has on their phones today. Messenger being one of the biggest ones now, you know, into, I don't know what the current thing is, 1.6, 1.7, 1.8 billion users, like using this kind of platform. And, and businesses as well, it's not just people using it from a you know, person to person, consumer to consumer, it's actually businesses are getting great effect from this. I'm gonna show you an example shortly of how we used it for one of our clients. So in essence, because we all use these mobile phones, they're with us everywhere, more than they are the laptops and the desktops. Our mobile phone is our communication device. How, as brands, can we become part of that communication network, that communication ecosystem without being threatening and without looking like we're trying to sell or push something um, across to these people. Here's some results of using Messenger that HubSpot did. So an event like this, HubSpot runner one called Grow with HubSpot um, in, in APAC. This is in Sydney and Melbourne. And it just shows you just by having this Messenger style app actually while people are at the conference, you can see the difference that it had and they compared this to just having a traditional landing page on the day or other traditional methods. As you can see here, if we look at the Sydney one, for example, because obviously the Melbourne one was first, so you, you learn a lot from stuff. They did it, they tweaked it, and then they ran the Sydney one. Of 912 people, almost 1,000 people at the event, 430 enrolled on the day. The big one there was there was a 78% open rate during the day. So people were really using this app because it was, it was easy. It was already connected to Facebook. It was on Messenger. They already had their mobile phone. The big thing was this last part here. 65 meetings with HubSpot were booked throughout the day. So they might be at a session like this and they're thinking, oh, I want to have a chat with someone from HubSpot, bang. And they were booking meetings during 
the conference, right? Whereas, as you all probably know, if you go to conferences all the time or expos or whatever it might be, you don't do anything until after the event. And there's this massive follow-up of people. But you're in the moment now. So if you want to have a conversation with somebody about something that someone's just said, how easy is it just to quickly book in, find their availability via, via a uh, meeting app and actually book in and have that session while you're there in the building? And then 15% of those um, were booked from people that enrolled. So some great results and HubSpot have done a lot more with this and a lot of conferences are using this kind of stuff now. The other thing we need to think about in terms of content and how we're having these first engagements is the middle of the funnel, right? That consideration, that important consideration stage. It's, it's a hard one because you think it's kind of where marketing is still playing an effect and it's also where sales would love to get their hands on it. You know, most traditional salespeople will just try and get in contact with anything with a pulse. It's kind of like, well, how, how do you keep sales back and marketing still qualifying the lead ahead of sales? That's very much the role of middle of the funnel. So we use things like this. So this is a ResMed um, uh, offer that we have called the free sleep assessment. So Re who's familiar with ResMed, the brand, yeah? So Re ResMed is basically like people who have sleep disorders potentially could have a uh, sleep disorder called sleep apnea and then you can have a treatment down the track so it's kind of like they're a medical technology company that help people sleep better um, that's basically what they do so obviously in the middle of the funnel often makes sense that you have a sleep assessment to decide well could there be something going on why aren't i sleeping very well so this sleep assessment works like this it's actually built on on hubspot because what we want to do is everything that the people fill in we want to actually put that into our CRM so that when our salesperson finally gets the lead at the end they can go back into the CRM and have a look at the conversation that has happened and then continue that conversation afterwards. So as you can see it's a simple assessment tool and you can think about how could you use this in your businesses, you know, um, a relevant assessment to your product, uh, assessment to your solution. People go through it, they love this kind of self-assessment and at the end of it it gives you possible answers based on the calculations that are in the back end in the database. Um, it's either high risk, low risk or mid risk, right? And if it's a high risk, instantly a workflow is triggered off to the sales team to say, hey, this lead now has gone from middle of the funnel to a high priority opportunity level. You need to talk to these people because obviously they have a sleep problem, it's been identified and they're probably ready to talk because they've already identified the fact that there is an issue that they may have. The results of this particular middle of the funnel offer have been amazing. If we have a look at this, the conversion rates are greater than 40%, right? The average I think for a landing page is around 10%. You know, and, and that's a really good one. So this is, this is getting a greater conversion of 40% because it's relevant, it's targeted, it's exact. People aren't going to fill it in if they're not qualified, if they don't have a sleep disorder. The next thing is, as you can see here, and the industry average, sorry, for a landing page is 4%, um, even less. The lead generation form that's built on HubSpot saw the monthly leads triple. So because people are going through this, their lead volume tripled by having this particular um, offer at the middle of the funnel. But then we go a bit further than that because we say, okay, so if they're more qualified, they're going to go further down the buyer journey. So 25% of these leads went on to become customers who purchased the home sleep test. So the very first touch point for ResMed is that you pay to have an in-home sleep test where you pay for it, it gets delivered, and then you can find out more scientifically whether you have a sleep disorder or not. But the bottom one down the line there is 10% of those original people go on to purchase long-term sleep therapy and treatment. So those figures are pretty pretty awesome when you think about how this one offer has helped push people and qualify them down a buyer journey to actually become long-term customers. <coughs> so now we look at the sales qualified lead. So if we've got them down this far, we've marketing qualified them, we're, we're now ready to build that relationship, right? So this is where sales get involved. So this is where the sales qualified leads come in and this is where we're actually going to start to build that relationship in our kind of relationship model. And it's part of this omni-channel experience. And you hear people talking about omni-channel kind of all the time. But the whole idea of um, omni-channel is the fact that, you know, it's seamless. It's frictionless. The customer is always at the focus. You know, at the center of attraction is the customer. But if you run any kind of ecosystem like this, the idea is, is that that brand voice, that brand experience is is the same, whether it's uh, someone's telling you word of mouth, you've got to go and see these guys and how they're portraying your brand in their way that they would communicate it. If you've got a bricks and mortar, a physical store, an online marketplace, an e-commerce site, or a social network, you need to kind of coordinate this whole environment together and make it this kind of seamless experience. 
We call it this. Now, it, as a statement, it looks quite long, and it also looks like it's very, very hard to do. But the essence of everything that we're talking about so far is the right message at the right time to the right person with the right information on the right channel every single time. That's what people want. The perfect brand experience is exactly that. Now, we need to identify there's a lot of things that we can do in the background that like we just said. Technology will play a big role in how we deliver this because we need to be able to understand where people sit to be able to deliver them the right message at the right time with the right information. And the right information is then opens up a whole range of what content's right for the right time for the right people. So one of the things that I wanted to focus on, because this is a, a big thing that's, um, I know a few of you guys, who's using chatbots for their business in any way? Chatbots, down the front, one, okay. So not many of you. So I wanted to share with you why I think chatbots work. Now chatbots do not replace humans, but they can help automate the process and work side by side with the human experience in your organization. So we have a chatbot that you can see here. This is kind of like typically how a nurture chatbot would work. So it's not trying to be machine learning. It's not trying to replicate being a human. It's just triaging someone through from a, an experience that they might have on, in this case, Messenger. It could be off your website. But as you can see, it's going through. It's asking them in a conversational way how they can help. This is, of course, linked as well to live chat. So you can, if someone's online, they can just go seamlessly from this into a live chat conversation. We try and give them some content to kind of help them make their decision. They could be further up the funnel. They just want a piece of content. They couldn't find it. We might give them a library of content. Um, then we'll ask the question, was it useful? In this case, well, they're going to say, well, it wasn't really what I was looking for. Um, we're trying to be a little bit human there, oh dear. Okay, so perhaps you'd like to actually talk to somebody instead. So this is all automated, it's gonna be 24 seven, this could be happening at three o'clock in the morning, it doesn't really matter when and where. So they're gonna put in their email address because we need to keep in contact with them and obviously then ask where they're based, because obviously we've got offices around the world so they could be anywhere in the world right now. So what, by telling us what it is, um, they get to meet this, uh, this character here. Um, and then that gets booked directly into my calendar. And this thing now we have working for us all the time, like I, I can go into my calendar tomorrow and there will be a bunch of, if I haven't blocked my calendar out, there'll be a bunch of bookings that are kind of sitting in there ready for me to kind of have a, have a chat with. So the whole idea is use a chatbot in a narrative way. Think about the narrative first. Think about the conversation you're going to have. And think about if you're going to have a chatbot like this, a simple chatbot, think about having a chatbot at various levels of the buyer journey. The conversation that you would have with someone at the awareness stage is going to be a totally different conversation to what you're going to have at the decision stage. So your chatbot can't talk across all of those different levels. So think about a different chatbots. And one of the challenges, and we, we, we kind of, um, not so much challenges, but opportunities, is that we, we see a world where a chatbot might lead off to another chatbot. Like if there's no humans available to talk to, the chatbot in the awareness stage could at a certain point be triggered off with the data that we know to trigger off to a chatbot at the middle of the funnel that then triggers off to a chatbot at the bottom of the funnel. So you imagine these chatbots can sort of work together based on helping somebody in their time through the buyer journey. The least technologically, technologically enabled members of your team are by far the best people to help you develop a chatbot. Most of the times people in an organization will go straight to the tech team and say, hey, we need a chatbot. But as you guys know, the tech team aren't necessarily the people having the conversations with the people at the end. So think about the people that aren't in the tech, ne technical department and think about how can we have that. Here's an example again, uh, I'm gonna use HubSpot as an example. They did a whole test of this and they do a lot of this stuff because they're always pushing the boundary, especially around conversation marketing. But they tried to put people, like they did a whole bunch of tests to see where all these inquiries were coming into the organization. And being a software kind of platform product, they put them into these three buckets, or three intents of what people were coming to their website for. Number one was support. They just need help with the tools they're already using. So they were coming to the website searching for support. The next one was sales. They wanted to, some information about tools they weren't using you know, more information about new stuff that they wanted to learn or to buy. And then the last one was kind of like, they kind of fitted into this other, other bucket um, of which they had to triage people out of. So how they did it was created like a chatbot similar to this where you're gonna triage these people out based on their intent. So the conversation here is, 
uh, what are you actually looking for? Your info about the products I'm not yet using. This chatbot is connected back to the contact record in the CRM. So in the contact record in the CRM, because I've already put their email address in, so we know who they are, or the cookies triggered, so we know who they are, the chatbot can fire back to the contact record to see what products are they using, so therefore by default determine what products they aren't using, and then from there, info about products I'm not yet using, trigger off a conversation that talks about, well, we notice you're not using the sales CRM, let's talk about sales. Second one is help with products I'm already using. That links to, again, the next steps, because we know by going back to the CRM, they're using one, two, or three modules or products, and then we're going to actually start talking to them about that. And then the last one is collect inquiry. We might go into a different kind of workflow that starts to ask some questions. Well, where's your, like, similar to the one I showed you just before, where's your biggest problem right now? Is it sales? Is it marketing? And kind of take them down a different journey. This is kind of what it looks like in the back end. So it's very much creating a, almost like a lucid chart, chart journey in terms of how the conversation might be. Um, as you can see down the left hand side, someone from our team will be here shortly. In the meantime, let's have a chat about what you're interested in. So meanwhile, we're trying to find or raise someone in real time to support, talk to them. But in the meantime, we're going to try and kind of get some more information, some more context about what their inquiry is all about. And then at the very, very bottom there, hands off to the uh, internal sales consultant via that meeting app, or if they're online, it will go straight into a live chat mode. So we have one at Sorted Stone where um, I can get pinged on Slack or Messenger and start a conversation with a prospect that's been through this particular um, chatbot and they've just handed off directly to me and then I've started the conversation if I'm online or whoever's online, like a round robin type of thing via other formats like Slack. So in essence, our, our kind of our gatekeeper is our chatbot. It's helping self-select, it's helping qualify our leads, it's certainly sorting out the support chats because we don't want our sales team talking to support people. It's qualifying our sales chat so we can get deep and meaningful and it's handing off to book a time so we're focusing on more high quality chats and getting those conversations more um, in context. And this is the results that HubSpot found by doing this particular test with a whole bunch of stuff. 75% more people interacted with the bot than the live chat for whatever reason. They decided that the chat bot was maybe less human, <laughs> less threatening. I don't know, but people, 75% of them started using this rather than just going direct to a live chat and trying to have a conversation with a real person in real time. Qualified chats increased, 55% completed all the qualifying questions before they reached the human. So they didn't mind answering the questions because they were in context to the inquiry that they were making. So 55% went through that. And then 182%, this is the interesting one, were actually more qualified leads than if they'd gone through live chat alone. So that's a kind of an interesting one because you kind of think, well, live chat is a general conversation with a real person, whereas this is a little bit more, I don't know, less threatening, more focused, better triaging, whatever it might be, but 182% became more qualified at the end of the journey when they purchased from, from HubSpot through that process. And it works for both small business or large business as well. Like it's, you know, you can go wider with a chat bot and sort of start very, very wide you know, what are your pain points? What are you really interested in? What's your, your biggest challenges right now? And then kind of triage them down. Or you can actually go with very specific. Okay, are you interested in this product, that product, or something else? So have a think about how you could use chatbots in, in everything you do, because they're, they're, they're not complicated to do anymore. You don't need a whole development team to do it. You know, from a HubSpot platform, they're built in. Conversations and chatbots are built in to their platform itself. Um, there's Drift, everyone heard of Drift. Drift is, again, a, a big leading platform so that you can, you can subscribe to. It's not super expensive. And then start building these kind of chatbots out across your whole experience. I'll give you one example that we did for Facebook. This was a partnership we did with Facebook um, and HubSpot. Um, just to kind of measure the difference between a traditional landing page like this versus the same experience in a messenger environment, right? And the whole idea is if you wanted to go and visit a display home, you know, you're, you're looking at building a new home, so you want to go and visit a display home, then um, you would go to this landing page, typical landing page to book in to go and visit one of the display centres to say, like, yeah, I'd like to come and have a look at it. You'd, uh, as you can see, a lot of friction. It's not live. It's just you're going to fill in this form. You're going to um, then wait for someone to call you back on that phone number. 
when they get that landing page inquiry, they might call you back the same day, it might be the next day if you're doing it at night. So you can see there's a lot of friction, a lot of delays, right? So we wanted to take this experience and take it and make it a little bit different by using it on a, on a messenger platform. So we're only going to use messenger, but we also compared it to what was happening with the landing page. And you could see that what we wanted to do here is make it just a little bit different. So we, we changed the landing pages to make sure the two were the same. But we thought what, what would be good is if you could book in to go to a display centre in your own time, right? Because people are busy. Most display centres in Australia are only open on weekends. Um, and that's probably the busiest time for people that work all week. So we thought, what if you could book in your own one-on-one -on -one display tour with an actual sales rep? And you could say, I want to come with my wife, 7 o'clock on a Wednesday night, and book it in. So this is where we came up with this personalised walkthrough tour type of thing. We added a bit of video in there to kind of tantalise the people. It was kind of like a teaser for this new display home which was just opening up, so no one had actually been through it yet. So we created this kind of experience, kind of video to kind of entice people. Um, and then we just did the A-B test. Some went through to the traditional landing page and some went through to this particular um, chatbot. As you can see, now look at this experience as compared to the other experience. So straight away it's like conversational. They've, they've hit on, they're still staying in the same platform. They're on Facebook, they're staying on Facebook. They're not being taken off to the web page and creating this friction between two different platforms. They're actually still in the Facebook environment, maybe still on their mobile phone, and they've gone from the ad into this kind of conversational way of chatting through what was going on. Then they can have a look at a bit more information. So let's have a look at the display homes that are actually available to you now. So they have a look at the display homes, and then from there they go through and then they can say, well, I'd like to come in, in this case, 6 p.m. on, on a Wednesday, um, and then they're going to like book it in. So they're going to check the calendar now of the sales rep to make sure they don't already have a booking at 6 o'clock and then they're going to come back and they're going to say, you know, that time is available, now you need to kind of meet the, the humans. These are the guys that are going to take you through, um, ask for their email address just to confirm, but as far as the consumer is concerned, they've booked in now at 6 o'clock with their wife to go and visit this display centre. More qualified lead because they've made the intent to go to the display centre and far more frictionless because they've actually, you know, taken the time to go through that experience. So just think about that. How can you change the experience from a, from a friction landing page that takes time to respond to that which is instantaneous, happens straight away, the guys, the consumers can then move on to the next thing. Because they've got a million and one things to do like all of us have. What do they do? They can just do it, move on, whatever time they want to do it. So the last part, number four, is on how do we make this commitment, you know, in a relationship? You know, because we've, we've made that relationship, we've built the relationship. How do we make the commitment so, that, so it actually lasts? And this is where technology comes in. So in 2011, there were 150 companies in the marketing technology landscape. It's, you guys would have heard about this before. Nowadays, it's actually surpassed, I think it's like over 5,000, even close to 7,000. These are all the technology platforms that you can choose from to help automate that whole process that we've just gone through. Because we all agree that you can't do it manually. It'd be very, very hard to understand 24-7 where these people are, having conversations, managing the relationship. So you need technology to do it. But the hard thing is if you pick any one of those or a combination of those, the biggest fear factor for most businesses is what if I pick the wrong one? What if it's not as user friendly? What if it, my team don't like it? What if it doesn't connect? Right, that's one of the biggest things we find with customers is, okay, I might want this technology platform here to do whatever as part of my buyer journey, but it needs to talk to my ERP over here. How do I connect these two together? So this holy grail of everything on one platform that talks to each other is really the driving force of most brands today, that they just want this kind of one system that kind of measures everything. We actually use a platform called G2 Crowd to help simplify this. So if you go to G2 Crowd, they're a company that just tests, measures, looks at the user experience of all the technology platforms. So these guys here, as you can see here, this is the latest one that came out for 2019 that kind of put everybody in these four kind of brackets. So kind of high performers, market leaders, contenders. So you can sort of, the interesting thing with this map is you can track 
newcomers to the platform or the ecosystem and how they're going. Uh, they, they might start in one quadrant and move into the other quadrant. But you can see the big players where you really want to be is in the top right hand corner. You've got things like Salesforce, Oracle's sort of starting to come into there, HubSpot are there. Um, you know, there's a couple of others that you might recognize brands for, but really that top right quadrant is based on the ones that are leading, yeah, therefore more users, um, the user experience is better, and they're growing um, as, as, you know, as a platform. Um, so again, use some of this research to determine before you jump in, boots and all, into a platform if you're not already in one, how do I make a platform that's going to grow with my business and how is it going to do more of what I want across the journey because you don't want too many platforms that aren't talking to each other. Um, so the whole idea, I talked about the flywheel, you know, let's call it the growth flywheel. We need platforms and, mark, uh, and tech that actually gives us this kind of whole area. So our sales team are using the same platform or at least an integrated connected platform. So we can track the journey that came from marketing. Like how did they first engage with us? What are the conversations that they've had? What is the context of those? So then my sales conversation can be more in line with continuing the conversations from before and going deeper. And then once I become a customer, how do I then continue through service so service knows who I am? The worst thing you can do is someone who's a customer comes back to your business and you ask for their first name or you ask for who they are. Like they expect to be known, they expect to be part of your, your tribe as you move forward. So back to that kind of one that I had before, I just want to share with you, this is a technology that we use. Um, and again, like there's a bunch of stuff, but it all connects and talks to each other. I just wanted to kind of share with you from our end how we work. Obviously, as HubSpot partners, we use a lot of HubSpot for everything that we do. But from the left hand side, we're using things like SEM Rush and, and Google to actually create this you know, understanding what people are searching for, you know, what, what is the SEO value, how are people coming to us, what are, what, are the, what are the key words that they're kind of finding us for. Google Analytics is showing us a lot of stuff as well that then HubSpot shows more of in terms of more engagement, whereas Google Analytics is showing a lot more. We use Google across the business as well. So again, that seamless transaction of our emails connected to HubSpot, like I can, I can track every email that I send. It can trigger off rem reminders for me. So we're using the Google suite across Google Docs. So we can see who's, who's looking at our Google Docs and everything. So we're very much using this kind of streamless uh, kind of Google stuff. For our presentations, we use a thing called Mural. I don't know if you've, uh, again, these are technology platforms that may work for us, might not work for you guys. But if you're in the creative space, have a, chat, have a look at Mural, M-U-R-A-L. It's, um, it's a colored card type of system, but you can uh, share ideas and, and kind of creative kind of uh, concepts with clients and they can play around with stuff as well. Our proposals are all done with Quilla. I used to use um, a number of different platforms for proposals. Quilla is um, from Australia actually, it's an Australian startup, but the thing is just super awesome. Like oh, I used to take me maybe an hour to put a proposal together for a client, it now takes maybe five minutes. So how quickly can you get your proposals out? Like if someone wants to buy from you, how quickly can you make it? There's nothing more frustrating than going to like a department store and you, and you want to buy a pair of jeans and you can't find anyone to, to, to take you to a counter and buy the jeans, right? It's just as frustrating if they're wanting to buy from you on your website um, or, or from you as a service and you, they've got to wait a week for you to get the proposals back. So the quicker you can get back to people, the better. They reckon most of the deals are done in the person that calls in the first five minutes. So and I'm finding that is so, so true. If someone inquires today and sends me a, uh, an email that sort of says I'm interested in doing something, I, we have got a five minute rule. We want to get back to these people within five minutes because they've made the effort and we need to make the effort back. Um, we use teamwork across all our organizations. So teamwork is a fantastic internal project system. We pushed it to the limits as far as teamwork goes. Um, that then pulls from teamwork into fantastic data driven um, platforms like Databox and Grow, which allow us to kind of see what's working, where, which products and services are more profitable than others, you know, how, how long does it take us to deliver a project, uh, product, um, all of those kind of stuff. So this whole kind of journey now is all mapped or, or underpinned by some of the technology that we can have. So I wanted to kind of closing, um, sort of leave you with a bit of a brand experience that I had between these two great companies, Uber and Lyft. Um, you don't have Uber in Singapore, right? I only found that out when I got to the airport and it says Uber is not available in your city. Um, do you guys have Lyft? I didn't even try Lyft. No, so I went to the old taxi. Um, but anyway, so these two are, are, are growing around the world. Um, there's Ola, is it Ola? Is that, what's the one in Singapore? 
They sound like a few all at once then. Okay, so you, it's the same sort of platform kind of experience, but my experience was between two, again going back to what I was saying before about how the product is the same, but how they sell is different, right? And this is the, the, the essence of what it is. So the difference between, I was always using Uber, and then when I was in America, I used this thing called Lyft. And the reason I used Lyft was because it was in our offices in a place called Monrovia, which is near Pasadena in Los Angeles, and they had a deal on with the local council that if you use Lyft, because they were just branching into this uh, area, it would cost you 50 cents for a trip, wherever, wherever you went in Monrovia. So we're staying here, and our office is over here, so we thought, great, 50 cents for a trip. So took the word of mouth, I thought, that's great. Downloaded the app for Lyft, booked my um, trip, and that was my bill. $5.80, right? Now, it's not a big expense, right? And I'm not a tight sort of person where I'm gonna think $5.80, but, the experience was damaged, right? I was expecting 50 cents for my ride and it was $5.80. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna test this out. So I actually went on and they have a customer chat bot that you can go on to. So I, I jumped on the bot when I got to the office and you can see this is the transcript here or, or the transcript after I jumped on the passenger help bot where I just said, hey, look, this is a situation. I was expecting it to be 50 cents. It was $5.80. Um, they came back and said, thanks for using our passenger help bot to let us know about your recent um, issue. We take every ride very seriously. Um, and if a ride doesn't meet our standards, uh, we look at it carefully. A member of our customer support team will email you once we start the review process. Now, anybody feel like I did in that last kind of paragraph, there's a fair bit of friction Feeling, I'm, I'm feeling like, okay, hang on a second, a member of our customer support team, a nameless member of our support team, will email you, so all of a sudden I'm going from a, a nice chatbot experience and an app experience to someone's gonna email me uh, when we start the review process. How long is the review process? So I'm thinking, what have I done here? Maybe I should have just walked away with my $5.80 because this thing is just gonna go crazy. Anyway. Have a look at the time check on there. It was 9.26 a.m., right? Here's the email that came through at 9.31 a.m., four minutes. What I was starting to think, oh, these guys are gonna start the review process. The review process was done and dusted and they responded in four minutes. This is what they sent back. Appreciate your time in reaching out to us on the phone. It looks like the promotional credit should have applied. As a courtesy, I've gone ahead and refunded the full amount of $5.80, which will return to your account within five to seven days. Welcome to Lyft, Tony. We are happy that you're part of our community. Um, stay safe and have a great day ahead. Wow. So I was expecting now, you know, a refund of $5.30, because I was expecting to pay 50 cents, but I got the whole thing back, 100% refund. So of course now, in four minutes, I'm super excited about this, so I send them back an email. And I said, thank you at Lyft. I love your service, right? And that's a nice thing to do as a customer, isn't it? You think that would be enough, but they said, no, hang on a second. Hang on, one moment, we love you more. Thank you very much for being a pleasure to assist you. I'm more than happy to hear that you're having a great experience. So uh, it actually did stop there. I mean, it could have gone on forever. This love we were just sharing was just fantastic. Um, the love of Lyft, but it just shows you how customers want this experience. And I'm here telling you about my Lyft experience a year or so after it happened you know, and every conference I go to, but I'm not telling you anything about Uber, right? Because I haven't had a similar experience with Uber. But in essence, this is what we've done. Attract, delight, and engage. We've gone through this whole kind of experience in that short little thing. You know, someone told me word of mouth, go and do this. It didn't work out. You know, so I was marketed to, I was attracted to, I engaged, I wasn't happy. They came back and they delighted me. And now I'm going around telling everybody else about it. So again, we're spinning the wheel again and we're going back through the whole process. So in closing, we just need to think about, you know, how things have changed. You know, the, the challenge now that we're going to have as we move forward is the battleground is going to be, is going to actually be fought and it's going to be won based on all of this aspect of how we sell rather than what we sell. We've gone from this bartering that we used to do years and years ago, a whole bunch of stuff happened in the, in the middle, and then we're now at this bit where we're buying from the couch. We're very much relaxed, we're having a very enjoyable experience. So think about 
it's not about what we sell anymore, it's about how we sell it. How can we streamline the way we sell and people buy from us? And the reason it's so important is because of this. Consumers are moving more and more to being selective with just five brands. You know, five brands, are we gonna be one of those five brands that really build a connection, that really build a relationship with our customers? Because if we're not, then one of our competitors is gonna be one of those five brands. So don't forget the love story, sort of stone forward slash conversations where you can take up more of what we've gone through in this masterclass. And also if you feel like you'd like to, at the very bottom of the conversation, you can then continue the conversation by booking a meeting in my calendar and experiencing the seamless process um, and having a real conversation with a real human like me um, at the end of it. So that's it, thank you very much. Um,